So Christian jargon, I suppose some of the some of the people that come into church that didn't grow up in the church uh, or haven't been saved very long, you know, some of the words are kind of like, eh, what in the world? You know, what's going on here? What's that mean? I remember when I went to one of my first council meetings, every the title to every page was a series of initials. I don't think anybody in council meeting knows what those initials stand for. They're just there. Uh, but they they stand for something. If you don't know what it is, then it doesn't mean much to you. Words are like cups. Words that used to mean something different years ago, that mean something years ago, mean something very different today, right? Are you with me on that? So the, the words are like cups. They hold meaning. And what I want to do today is try to take one of those cups and give it some meaning. In fact, I'm going to use a whole bunch of theological terms today but I'm doing that in order to focus on one theological term, and, and that term is grace. The word is grace, and I want to fill that word grace up with some meaning. I want to thank Charlie for choosing my topic today. Uh, we already had the bullet printed up, so uh, Jason said, hey, can you preach on grace? I said, yeah. I didn't have anything ready, so it was a good opportunity. We're talking about God's grace today. Um, so if you think about it, some of the words that we use in Christianity that might not mean much to people, we talk about being born again, sanctification, kingdom, ransom, confess, glorification, sanctification, new birth, NIV, ESV, KJV, uh, blessing, sin, gospel, tribulation, theology, on and on we could go with a lot of the terms that we might use regularly but really don't mean anything to some people. Well, today I want to give a little more significance to the, to the term grace. The grace of God is what eventually I want to focus on. But if you were to just look at the word grace or look it up in your dictionary, it's a pretty simple definition. And we understand that. We understand grace is to be kind. Uh, he showed grace to me. Uh, somebody who is considerate, someone who wants to bless someone else, have a gentle attitude towards somebody. Being gracious might be how you conduct yourself. It might even be how you walk. She walked graciously or he did. But in this context, we're talking about how we act or talk towards others, that we have a spirit of meekness, of gentleness, of kindness. A person who's gracious is someone who would provide something uh, to benefit someone else. And so there's grace involved with that. But as we go through the definition of grace, I need you to know that there's a, a more specific application of that within our context. In other words, as we talk about grace as Christians, we're talking about God's great kindness to us. The backdrop of that is this, that we're all sinners. And, and in fact, we don't really know how sinful we really are. Paul said he didn't know how sinful he was until the law was applied and it was almost like Paul was saying, until somebody told me I couldn't do something, then I really wanted it. And we don't really know how sinful we can be until opportunities present themselves. And truthfully, we are depraved people. We are a sinful people. Sin will take us further than we ever thought we could go. And so we have to be very, very careful to understand that we are a sinful people. We were born in sin. We were sinners by birth. We're sinners by choice. We sinned in Adam. We've chosen to sin. We are guilty. The Bible says of us that there's none righteous, no, not one. The Bible says of us even the good things we could offer to God are like canceled checks or dirty rags. It says all of our righteousness is as filthy rags. And so we are a sinful people. 
the depravity of our souls has not been completely revealed even to us. Paul didn't know his own attitudes and his own motivations for everything that he did, but when, sin, when the law was applied to his life, he realized how much he was inclined towards sin. And until we accepted Jesus Christ as our Savior, we were positively inclined to sin, and we had no attraction to God whatsoever. We're born in sin, we've chosen sin, and we're people who deserve the judgment of God. P.E. Hughes says it this way about God's grace, with that as a backdrop. God's grace is undeserved blessing freely bestowed on man. Undeserved blessing. Does that make sense? It's not performance-based. It's not about, well, Scott was a really good guy, and he really he gave his whole life, and he was so good and nice to his neighbors. I, by the way, I do have neighbors here. I hope I'm nice to you guys. But it, it's not because of all that. My dog does go on their lawn once in a while. But because of God, it's always God. God is always the right answer. God's always the right answer, and we just have nothing to offer. Listen, you can't gain your salvation, and you can't keep your salvation. It is a work of God. Other terms or definitions that we've used for grace, and you might want to write some of these down because some of you guys are going to be quizzed on these on Wednesday is God's undeserved favor. What we deserve, we don't get. But God gives us grace. He gives us favor. Another one is unmerited favor. In other words, we can't earn it. There is no merit. Another one is an acrostic, grace, G-R-A-C-E. God's riches at Christ's expense. So God's giving us riches. He's given us blessings. Grudem says this about it. He says that it is God's goodness towards those who only deserve punishment. And that is what we deserve. No matter how good we become or how much God has done a work through us, what we truly deserve, we're not getting. Praise God because of the work of Jesus Christ. The atonement has satisfied the grace of God. And so we have two categories of grace. The first category is this. It's just general grace, that God generally blesses all mankind. If you're a human being, if you've ever drawn a breath, if you've ever ever taken a step, if you've ever through your senses experienced anything, and you have experienced the kindness of our great God and Savior who gives us good things to experience. Genesis talks about the fact that God created everything. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And it goes on to describe all the good things that God created. The crown jewel of God's creation was man and woman, humanity. And as a crown jewel, everything that God had created, he created to sustain life. His crowning work of creation was to create man and woman. Man and woman are distinct from animals. Now the DNA is similar. Why? Because we were all made from the dust of the earth. But we are distinct not because of our DNA were distinct because when God created man from the dust of the earth, he breathed into man's nostrils the breath of life. And we were created then in the image of God. The Bible says that God created man in his image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. Humanity reflects the image of God and the maleness and femaleness of the human race. We together constitute God's great gift we're his crown jewel, we're his creation. And in that, God has graciously blessed us. He's given all mankind great blessings. We also see that whether you're saved, unsaved, mean, nice, generous, stingy, whatever the case, God still blesses you. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 45 says, for he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. God does a great work that affects all people. And not only that, he sustains it all. What do I mean by that? So he created it, right? Have you ever thought about the fact that we're floating in midair on a ball? This ball we call planet Earth and around us are all these things, the planets, the sun, the moon, the stars, the galaxies. If you've never watched the the movie Indescribable, I think it's in the church library. I'm not sure, but uh, I think it's there. Talk to Janelle. We think it might be there. But if it's not, you can find it on YouTube. 
But it talks about the expanse of the universe and how tiny we are. But God in his great love holds it all together. He holds the atoms together. He holds the groupings of atoms together, the earth together, the leaves, the plants. He holds it together. He holds the sun, moon, and stars together. He holds the planets that spin, the moon that goes around the earth, the earth that goes around the sun. He holds it all together. There's some verses about that. My favorite verse on it is Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through 17. It says this, He's the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by Him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through Him, that is Jesus Christ, and for Him, and He's before all things, and in Him all things hold together. Without Jesus Christ, we'd fly apart. We could not sustain life without his great grace on all of mankind. Hebrews 1, God who at sundry times and in divers' manner spake in times past by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken to us through his Son, Jesus Christ, who is heir of all things. He is the radiance of his glory, the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. Why does it hold together? Because God said so. By the word of his power, he holds it all together, and he knows all of it intimately. John 1, 1 through 4, in the beginning was the word, Rick and I were quoting this together last week, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word, what Rick? The word was God, this is Jesus Christ, the same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, that is Jesus Christ. And without him was not anything made that was made. And in him was life, and the life was the light of men. Jesus Christ holds it all together. He sustains us. He shows great grace to all of us. Not only that, he gives blessings to all. James 1.17 says, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Every good gift that you experience is from God. You might have done it. You might have patted yourself on the back. However, it was God who enabled you. God gave you your intelligence. He gave you your looks. He gave you your body. You contributed to some of that. Some of us have. But he gave us the one we have. He's given us all good things. The ability to think, the ability to, to earn money. Some people have a gift of losing money. So we have a lot of varied gifts. All good things come from God. Also in this idea of grace is a, another category. It's a category of special grace. So we have general grace, that is that God is good to all of humanity. He's gracious to us. He's kind to us. But we also have this idea of special grace. This special grace is, is something that is apl applied to the children of God. This isn't for everybody. We know that Jesus Christ paid for the sins of all mankind. We know that the payment of, that Jesus Christ made is sufficient to pay the price for all sin, effective only for those who call upon the name of the Lord to save them. We know that it's sufficient, but effective only for those who call. And so we don't believe in universal, universalism. We believe that this grace of God was given to those who are the children of God or who will be the children of God. One of the terms I want to use is this. It's a, a term called regeneration. So God's grace causes us to be regenerated, a theological term. By the way, one of my favorite songs, maybe some of you follow this guy. His name is Shy Lin. He has a song called Atonement, Question and Answers. Uh, maybe I'll play it for, for some of you guys on Wednesday, but it uh, just goes through theological terms. I'm not into hip-hop, but I like that song, and uh, it's very good. Shy Lin, Atonement, Question and Answers. Regeneration is this. We were once dead, but now we're alive. Amen? We were once dead. Ephesians says, and you who are dead in trespasses and in sins, has he made alive? We were once dead. Somebody said to me, I was always saved. No, you weren't. You might have been one of the elect, but you weren't saved until you were saved. And you weren't regenerated until you were regenerated. 
We were born in sin and our destination was condemnation, was damnation. It wasn't the destination that we currently have. Ephesians 5 says this, Even when we were dead in our trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace have you been saved through faith. It's not your own doing. It's a gift of God. It's not the result of works, lest any man should boast. To be saved, salvation, to be born again. There was a guy who had a question about being born again, right? Why do we call it being born again? There was a a man from the Pharisees. His name was Nicodemus. He came to Jesus by night, and he asked him what it was to be born again. Jesus said, listen, you, you can't see the kingdom of God unless you're born again. A term from Jesus. Nicodemus is like, oh, what do I have to do? Enter into my mother's womb and be born again? Jesus said, the wind blows where it blows, and you don't know where it's coming from, but you must be born again. The end of that whole context is John 3.16. Jesus is talking to Nicodemus, where he says, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Regeneration is being made New. It's salvation by faith alone through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. We're saved by faith, by the way, which comes from God. Here's a verse for you. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing the word of God. That's how faith comes. You didn't have it within you. You didn't just choose one day, I'm going to be a Christian. You know what? God did that work first in your life. We'll talk about that in just a moment. For by grace have you been saved through faith. It's not your own doing. It's a gift of God, not of works, so that no one may boast. You can't earn it, and you can't keep it. It's been given by grace from God. Because God was so good to us, we didn't deserve it, did nothing to earn it. He gave it to us because he's kind to us, and he loves us. Can't brag about it. It's only from Jesus Christ. We ought to boast in him. Amen? Boast in Christ. Next, he transforms us. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Gives us the idea that he makes us into something different than what we were. Can anybody here testify that you're something different than what you were? You're not the same man, woman, or child that you used to be. I think all of us should be able to say that. And if you can, I hope at the end of this sermon, you will. We're not the same people we were. Listen, where there's life, there's growth. There might not be enough for anybody to see, but if you got life within you, you're alive and there's growth and God's at work in your life. And he's transforming you and he's changing you. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. The next one is another theological term, sanctifies. The word sanctifies means that God made us special. He set us aside as special, but there's an aspect of sanctification that's ongoing. Sanctification is the idea that God is changing us to be like Jesus. Isn't that what Paul wanted when he says to be like Jesus, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection, that I would be conformed to his death. Paul wanted to be like Jesus. We're becoming like Jesus. We're not there yet. I'm not there, neither are you. But we're becoming more like him as we grow. And so he's transforming us. He's sanctifying us. Philippians 1.6. And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. And at that day, we will be in glorification. Sanctification to glorification. And it's then that we'll no longer struggle with these earthly sins. And we'll, we'll look on Jesus and we'll, we'll know even as also we are known. We'll have the mind of Christ. And so we're looking forward to that. But he's sanctifying us. He's setting us aside. The next term is this. Uh, in God's grace, he redeems us. It's the idea that we're in a jail. You ever been in jail? Don't tell me. I don't want to know. I've been in jail. I used to go in several times a week. 
Northampton County Prison. I was in charge of the ministries there. It's a really weird feeling when they close those bars and it locks in place. Their key was like that big. I'm not exaggerating. They pull out this great big key. I felt like I was in, in an old castle. They'd open that gate and let me in. One of my first times there, the, the uh, volunteer director knew I was a believer, knew I was a pastor. She knew me, uh, Sandy. And Sandy said, Scott, I need you to talk to this guy. He just committed a very, very violent crime, and I want you to give him the gospel. So they put me in this little dinky room with him, and I'm like, ah. I gave him the gospel and was able to do that many times, work with the uh, juvenile detention center for years. Uh, they were required to uh, let me preach to them once a week. And I can tell you, when you're inside the cubicle or in the jail cell, yeah, it's a different feeling. You think no big deal, but it's, it does something to you, and you're in there, and you can't get out. When you were born, you were in a jail cell, so to speak, and you were locked up, and you could do nothing to save yourself. You could do nothing to be set free. You were captive. You were bound. You were a slave to sin. But Jesus Christ has led us out of our prison. Amen. He set us free. The Bible says if we're free, if he set us free, we will be free indeed. Praise God. I'm a child of God. Amen. Yes, I am. And so we've been set free. That's redemption. Redemption is we've been let out of the jail. The shackles have been taken off our wrist. We no longer have to serve sin. We may choose to, but we no longer have to. We've been redeemed. It says this, Ephesians 1.7, In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of His grace. And it's all from God. It's all from God through Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians says this, All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to Himself and gave us a ministry of reconciliation. So we've been reconciled to God. We're the ones that are wrong and we had to be made right to be restored to God. And not only have we been made right as children of God, we've been given a ministry of reconciliation. We're to help other people get right with God, to tell them that Jesus saves and that Jesus can set you free and you no longer have to serve sin. Isn't God's grace awesome? Well, he set us free. Who then can experience this special grace? All right, so I believe a couple of things, and I know I'm a, I'm a conundrum. I know I'm, I'm in conflict with theological terms and systems of thinking, but one of the problems is, is we put our thinking in a box, and it seems like our view is more important than the actual gospel itself. I want to tell you, the Bible says that God has chosen us, we're elect, we're predestined before the foundation of the world. But I also want to tell you this, that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved we got two rails, huh? Two rails, and there's grass in between. The grass in between is the part you don't understand, even though you think you do. Now, if you do, then you're further along than me. But I say, let us believe the whole Bible. Let us accept it. Let's stop trying to answer the questions and wrestle with this thing that's so beyond our comprehension that we actually hand it over to God. So he has chosen us. I can't answer why I'm able to be here, why my wife and I were saved at a young age, why we were born in the home we were in, why we were able to accept Christ as our Savior, but I believe it. And I also believe that anybody who hears the truth of the Word of God and has the Holy Spirit of God drawing them can be saved. I believe that the appeal or the general appeal is to everyone. And I think a general appeal is a genuine appeal. My wife made cookies for the roofers that got our roof replaced. I would have done it myself, but roofing's over my head. Anyway, she made cookies. (laughs) Sorry. (laughs) She made cookies and she carried them out. But what if she said, hey, everybody, I want you to have cookies, but they're only for Scott. But all of you, you can have a cookie. Listen, if God gave an appeal, it's genuine. I believe that Jesus Christ, the death of Jesus Christ and his atonement is sufficient to pay the price for all sin. It's effective only for those who call upon the name of the Lord to save them. You want to know if you're elect? Did you sincerely repent before God? Listen, you weren't born saved. You were in sin. We already looked at it. And it's him who's made us alive. 
And even if you're more of a bent to reform theology, I want to tell you, if you've never come to the point of repentance, it may be the case that you are not a child of God. And I want to say to you that the death of Jesus Christ is sufficient to pay the price for your sin, but it's only effective for those who call upon the name of the Lord to save them. Have you called on the name of the Lord? Have you accessed this great grace from God? Bible makes it clear, Titus, uh, Romans 10, 9, 10, 13, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. We believe in salvation by faith alone through the shed blood of Jesus Christ, by grace alone because God enables us, and nobody ever yet got saved unless you first heard the truth of the word of God and unless the spirit of God drew you. You didn't go seeking God. He sought you first, and it's then that we were saved. God's grace is available to all. Titus 2.11, for the grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared to all men. And so only God's children receive God's special grace. Have you received it? Are you a child of God? Yes, I am. And my prayer is that you would be too. And if you are not, I pray that while I'm preaching or during the song at the end, that you would kneel down where you are or sit in your seat or kneel here or come forward to have somebody talk to you, that you would make sure of your relationship with Jesus Christ. So that's who experiences special grace. God is the source of all blessing. It began with God. I just quoted this a little bit ago. 1 John chapter 4 and verse 10. Herein is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us. And he sent his son to be the propitiation or satisfaction for our sin. He satisfied the wrath of God. Verse 19, we love him because he first loved us. God is the source of all blessing. It started when we were totally lost in sin. When we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Well, I got to get my life right. Once I do, then I'll go to church and I'll get saved. I got to get some things organized. And, you know, then listen, we're sinners. You couldn't get much worse than that, could you? Now we can act, act out our depravity in deeper levels, but we're sinners in need of a savior. Ephesians 2 says, even when we were dead in our trespasses, he's made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved and raised us up and and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming age he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not the result of works, lest any man should boast. And you know what? He, he does it in spite of who you are and in, who, in spite of who I am. Romans 5, 8, but God showed his love to us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Romans 5, for if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. 2 Corinthians 8, 9, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake became poor, so that you by his poverty might become rich. Romans 5, 6, for while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. We must live in light of the grace of God. We walk this trail of life, respond to His grace, live in His grace, celebrate in it. I've got a few things that I want to say in application of this. What, what difference should grace make in our lives? Number one, I would like to know that it's given you an acute realization of who you are. You're not good enough to offer something to him. God's not impressed with you. He loves you. He's not impressed with me. He loves me. He's gracious. He puts up with us, and he, he's kind, and he blesses us. But he's not impressed with performance. Christianity is not performance-based. It's not about religion. It's about a relationship with Jesus Christ. You need to have an acute realization of who you are. If God's done a work in your life, and through you, and he's helped you to change others, then we give God the glory. Amen? We're doxological in our purpose. In other words, we exist to glorify God, not ourselves. And if we find ourselves telling one too many good stories about ourselves, well, I told them, or I showed them, or if they would only listen to me, and I did it, but come on now. 
God is the one that does the work through us. And he gave us the ability to think. And if he's done that, then give him the glory. To God be the glory, great things he has done. Paul said it this way, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. Paul didn't take credit. And his grace uh, toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. 1 Corinthians 15.10. Paul didn't take the credit. He was thankful because of the great grace of God and the great things that God had done through the Apostle Paul. Secondly, I want it to cause you, I want grace to cause you to have a total dependence on God. You know, we're, we're do-it-yourselfer kind of people and a little bit of elbow grease and we'll get her done, you know. We'll, we'll do it and we can do it ourselves. I, I always tell my wife, please don't help me because I'm so frustrated. Uh, if she comes to help me, I'll just be grumpy to her too. But there I am struggling with something. Don't help me. Are we like that? God, don't help me. I got this one. We know what to do and how to do it and when to do it and where to do it. We got this one. I don't really need to pray about this. You know, there's never a no-brainer. You know, we always must depend on God. We must trust in Him. I think the grace of God ought to cause you to have a complete dependence on Him. The Apostle Paul, even when he was asking to be healed, had the answer from God, my grace is enough for you, Paul. And yes, you can struggle through. Or you can be blessed through a situation. But always remember it's God's grace. 2 Corinthians 12, 8. For this thing I besought the Lord three times that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee. For my strength is made perfect in your weakness. God's grace is enough. God's grace is enough. Thirdly, I want it to cause you to enjoy the riches of Christ. Enjoy the fact that God does a work in you. Enjoy the fact that God does a work through you. Enjoy that. He's blessed you richly with these things to enjoy his great blessing. There's nothing virtuous about being an ultra-stingy person. Now, some people enjoy that, I suppose. But it's not virtuous in and of itself to live your whole life and not enjoy the grace of God and the work that God has done. We need to lighten up a little bit and enjoy what God has done and what He's doing. Ephesians 1.3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. It's the now and later. He's given us a down payment of the Holy Spirit, and there's so much more to come, and we can look forward to it. But praise God for His great blessing. Enjoy the riches of Christ. Next, be humbled in the light of God's grace. If we realize that it's all from God, it will make us more and more humble. I don't remember who said it this week about the the little boy that was given a pin because he was so humble. And he wore that pin all around, (laughs) and they took the pin away from him. Anyway, he's so happy that he's so proud of being so humble. Anyway, humble and proud of it. Uh, God humbles us when we realize all glory goes to God. It keeps us in our place and uh, helps us to realize how good God is. And then lastly, it causes us to rejoice in the Lord. He doesn't make mistakes. He loves us. We're a child of God. That's a very stirring song that we sang. Yes, I am. And there's a place in our Father's house for me. There's a place for you. And some of you have sinned egregious sins. All of us have. They're they're egregious to God. Some have done some things that are worse than others. And in those situations, you realize the grace of God even more. You realize how big it is. We might not know, some of us. Well, I want to say to you, we've all sinned and it grievously against our God, we've offended His holiness and His righteousness, and God still loves us. Way before this country was a country in the 1700s, there was a man named John Newton. You probably heard of him. He started out his life, and at seven years old, his mom passed away two weeks before his birthday. The stepmom came in, and it wasn't a good stepmom, wasn't a good situation. I know many stepmoms are good, but this one wasn't. He ended up being sent away to school. And at 11 years old, he joined his father's ship. He became one of the the shipmates and uh, eventually found his way working for other ships. He He was so obnoxious that they kept whipping him and decided they had enough when they ended up on uh, an island to buy slaves, because at this point in time, he was on a slave ship. They left him there in Africa. They just left him. 
He was treated as a slave until his father finally sent somebody to look for his son, found him, and brought him back. You would think that that would have been his turning point. It was then that he became the captain of three ships that went over to get slaves to bring them to England. Then he had a medical emergency. He wasn't able to do it anymore. And then he financed slave ships. I mean, how much more low can you get if you've looked into any of this at all? If you haven't watched the movie about uh, Wilberforce, I encourage you to watch that movie. It talks about abolition in England before it hit our shores. But the way human beings were treated is just horrendous. John Newton was a part of that. And in his adult years, God got a hold of his life and convicted him of his sin. And he repented before God, made his life right with God. And it was this same John Newton that eventually became a pastor and wrote more than 200 hymns. And one of the hymns is probably the best known hymn that we have all sung. Maybe the best known around the world. I don't know. But the, the hymn is Amazing Grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. He wasn't saying that to, to impress somebody. He believed it. To save a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was once blind, but now I see. Listen, if you are one of those that's blind, the grace of God is available for you. There's a place in our Father's house. He loves you. He wants you to be a part of His family. His grace is available. Would you repent of your sin? Listen, while the Spirit of God is at work, won't you do it today? If you need somebody to talk to you, i got a whole ton of people that would be willing to talk to you. Or just come up here and pray. We'll, we'll let you be if you want to be left alone or sit where you are. Whatever the case, while the Spirit of God is at work, won't you respond? Won't you repent of your sin? And for those of us who are believers, let us remember our place. Let us remember the great grace of God, the work that God's done in our lives to save us from condemnation, to save us from the judgment we deserve, and to celebrate what God has done for us and to rejoice in it. Won't you rejoice in the grace of God, amazing grace, how sweet the sound.